Alright everyone and welcome back to another video on the channel and this week I'm joined by a local boxer Seamus Devlin. Seamus comes from the town of Paddingham like myself. I've known Seamus and his family for a while. Many a time I've seen him running through the streets of Marlborough Avenue in preparation for a bare knuckle boxing fight. But now he's turned over to the professional ranks of boxing and currently holds a record of 0 and 16. Now looking at this from the outside you may be thinking why does he bother? But Seamus is known in the sport as a journeyman and often travels up and down the country on a weekly basis taking fights at short notice purely out of a love for the fight game and nothing else. I hope that shines through in the interview and another person we've got joining us as well is his brother Alex to share with us what it's like to watch on from the sidelines as his brother puts his health at risk. The pair of them are very passionate about the sport of boxing. I hope that comes through on the interview as I've said and more importantly I hope you enjoy it. Any feedback that you've got would be greatly appreciated and I'll see you on the next one. So firstly Seamus I want to get, ask you a first question about how you first got into boxing and your first memories of walking into a boxing gym really. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't get asked that question quite often, mate. Um, my first memories of walking into a boxing gym, well, how it originally started for me, uh, it's, it's well documented now. It's um, It's been in the public domain a while. My story, as everyone knows, I um, I got lost to drug addiction and I lost everything and I hit rock bottom. But um, to cut a really long story short, I've always loved boxing. It's always been a passion of mine. And um, when I hit rock bottom, I had nothing left to lose, mate. So... I, um, I put both feet in, I jumped straight in and I got into the bare knuckle game. That was my introduction into combat sports, was actually through bare knuckle. That was my first fight. Yeah. Um, my first experience of walking into a boxing gym, do you know something, mate? It was, um, I was a little bit nervous, but it was almost just like um, second nature. I didn't even really think about it that much. Um, the smell of the gym, some of the faces that were in there, because it was the bare knuckle scene that I was first introduced to. Yeah. Uh, before the unlicensed scene. So some of the characters that were there were, um, they stood out, should I say. And it was, uh, yeah, it was just, as soon as I stepped in the gym, mate, I knew it was for me. I knew it was for me. Yeah, some people just say, don't they, that they get that inkling that, yeah, I'm having a bit of this. And was that the case for you, yeah? 100%, mate, 100%. I, I knew straight away um, the camaraderie between the lads, the honesty of the sport. It's an honest environment. Do you know what I mean? You can't get more honest than that. You get matched up on weight. Uh, you're fighting a guy who's got a similar experience and skill level to yourself. And yeah, I loved everything about the sport, mate. I knew it was for me straight away. In regards to the uh, boxing game, though, who would you say were your idols if you did have an interest in the sport as a kid growing up in terms of fighters? Oh, I love Nazim Hamed, Chris Eubank Sr. They were two um, enigmatic characters yeah. Growing up, um, watching those guys, you know, they were they, it was yeah, unbelievable, probably. weren't they? they? Were characters, pantomime villains, and the ultimate um, charismatic characters, uh, knockout punchers. They were just everything that um, a boxing fan or a combat sports fan would want from a fighter in those two. They encapsulated it, didn't they? So, yeah, those two people I loved growing up. I didn't have any idols specifically, not one person really. There was many fighters I idolized growing up through the years. There was Muhammad Ali. Um, there was, there was loads. There was Hector Camacho, very controversial yeah. fighter. A brilliant fighter. Brilliant, brilliant fighter. There was different fighters for me, mate. But, um, yeah, they were basically, they were a couple to mention, a couple of worthy mentions. And what about yourself, Alex? Because I know you you yourself has had experience in the unlicensed boxing game. What's your earliest memories of the sport and your interest in terms of fighters? I, I owe it all. Well, I attribute all this to my dad because it was it was our dad who used to sit down watching the boxing and we'd sit next to him on the arms of the chair watching the fighting and stuff, you know, the Eubank, Collins, Ben, all them boys, Nazim, you know, and the, watching those fights, you think, wow, you know what I mean? That's th Those are like superheroes, the nearest to it, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I'll never forget stuff like that. That's the, I think all blokes who like a bit of boxing especially people around our age group will say the same. Definitely. Those days were magic. I think it shows in this day and age as well with the likes of Tyson Fury, oh, everybody, yeah. everybody sees that he's not regimented, he's got a bit extra about him. And I think sometimes, I don't know if you agree, lads, that that's more worthy than the actual boxing side of things because he yeah. gets bums on seats, as they say. 
But I know that, like you said there, Seamus, you got into uh, the bare-knuckle boxing game first. What made you decide to do that rather than boxing? And would you say that... Uh, would you say bare knuckle boxing is more dangerous or less dangerous than bo- boxing itself? Right, yeah. Um, bare knuckle. What it was basically, mate, with the bare knuckle. The decision to go into bare knuckle was I was twenty seven years old when they decided to start this journey. So for me, realistically, boxing was out of the question because to me, I was never going to make a decent career out of it. Um, the bare knuckle thing was just starting to pick up traction. It was starting to come to fruition. Um, and I saw it was picking up a lot of uh, a lot of hype. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to give that a whirl. I knew I, had a, I knew I was durable. I knew I had a big heart. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to get on board and have a go at this and see where I can take it. Because I knew I had the passion. I knew I had the addictive personality. And so I knew I'd get stuck into it. But um, yeah, that, so that's why I made the decision to, um, to, to go into bare knuckle. The glove thing transpired later on down the line when I met um, Baz Neal, a gentleman from the unlicensed scene who had a gym in Bolton called Lacey's Boxing Gym. Oh, wow. Which I actually opened over here in Paddyham. But um, floods hit us twice and then COVID finished that off. But, um, yeah, so then when I met him, he said, you're actually more suited to boxing. You're a boxer, a back foot boxer. And that's how I ended up slipping into doing the unlicensed whilst I was actively fighting as a bare-knuckle fighter, which a lot of fighters do. A lot of active fighters do that on the unlicensed scene. Um, in regards to it being, is it safer than boxing? My my honest, humble opinion, it, it is safer for your brain. So in mm. terms of interior damage, it's safer, but exterior damage, so lacerations, cuts, uh, detached retinas, snap cheekbones are a lot more likely to occur in bare knuckle, but brain damage because there's a yeah. few reasons for that because when you when you take the gloves off now you, you like when you put a glove on you're spreading the surface area out you, you're taking your so you're taking that serration of the knuckles away and it makes it easier to take the shot the impact so you can sustain more damage with the gloves on which means you're fucking you're getting hit in the head your mm. your brain's rattling inside your skull that's where pugilist syndrome comes from Pun, yeah. punch drunk the term that's where that comes from but I suppose it's a case of pick your poison, mate. You know what I mean? But they're both dangerous sports. Um, But, yeah, if you talk about brain damage and stuff like that, that you don't see, you haven't seen many deaths from the bare-knuckle game yet. Like you say, sorry there, Shivers, like you say, though, you said pick your poison and it's clearly in your blood. And historically, though, Historically, bare knuckle boxing is a tra- traveler kind of fighting sport. Can you talk to us both of you about the your your fighting heritage within your family and and where the nickname for you, Seamus, the Celtic Cobra, comes from? Yeah, man. Um, my um, father was an Irish Republican, proud Irish Republican. Um, he did a bit of boxing in his youth, nothing serious. I don't think it was consistent with it. Um. I think it was more of a schoolboy stuff like that. He, he had a couple of bouts. Um, I think my uncle Vincent had one bout, but uh, I think <laughs> a swift body shot ended his boxing career pretty quick. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> we're not from we're not we're not from a long line of fighters, so we're from a, an Irish background, an Irish Republican background. But we're not from a long line of fighters. We're not from a fighting heritage, to be honest. Obviously, the Irish blood that obviously helps. Um, the pride, but, uh, bro. It's the sense of pride. That's what it is. Having pride in your name these days. That's why, you know, you watch some of these bare knuckle fights and you've got past the reason why they're fighting. You're just in awe of the fight. And then afterwards, people ask the questions, why, what, what was that actually about? Because the actual spectacle of two fellas putting their names, their pride on the line is bigger than money or a belt. And that's why some of these fights are just... Unbelievable to see because that's what's on the line. Yeah, yeah. I agree. You're talking there in terms of the spectacle, Alex. How does it feel for you outside of the ring to watch somebody you love, like Seamus, you, your brother, step into the ring and knowing that you know potentially things could go wrong, but you also see him doing what he loves? Exactly. It's like for me, Joe, it's like I've had this conversation with myself before. And the way I see it is when a soldier enlists and God forbid, you know, he does get struck down. 
he's gone out on his shield doing what he wants to do and what he loves to do. And to say otherwise, I think it's a disgrace to the person and to the dream and to, to what they're aiming for. So with my brother, it's the same. If anybody asks me that question, it's the same answer. If it did happen, God forbid, but he'd be doing what he loved and I would not want to stop that. So that's 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 always my same answer. I can see the passion in your voice, Alex. How does it feel for you, Seamus, to know that you've got the backing of your family like this? You, you know, it must really spur you on. Oh, it's great, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm really blessed, mate. My brothers are probably my biggest fans. I've got a strong support network, a family and uh, immediate family and friends. I'm blessed, mate. I have nothing to complain about. Uh, typically, journeymen like myself, because that's why I'm a journeyman, they don't usually have sponsors like myself. I mean, I've got five or six local sponsors um, who help me out financially all year round with prep meals, travel costs, all sorts. So I, I'm blessed, mate. I'm absolutely blessed and I'm doing what I love. And like the old saying, if you can do what you love, you won't work a day in your life, will you? Yeah, yeah definitely. I totally agree. And you mentioned there, you obviously, you started late in the sport. You're a journeyman. Obviously, that's an incredibly tough role as a fighter and you guys are the young from the heroes of the sport because you bring young fighters through as I was saying to Alex of Canberra before you came but you know because you experience a lot of losses you know let's have it right, right because sometimes that is your role how do you go about mentally preparing for the fight and can you talk to the viewers about the life of an on the road fighter because you're up and down the country every week and I've seen a box wreck yeah I'm, I'm glad you've uh, touched on that Joe mate because that's that's probably the um, the one aspect of the game that gets talked about the least, the psychological aspect of being a journeyman. Because physically, I'm lucky. I'm put together like an old leather boot, mate. So, I mean, physically, I, I'm not even going to lie. I don't struggle physically. You do have bits of wear and tear. Don't get me wrong. Soft tissue damage here and there. Bumps and bruises, lumps and bumps. But that comes with the game. It's, it's, um, it's here and there. But the psychological aspect, it's tough because... When you're losing, there's usually, obviously, there's a, the adrenaline spike as well. You're up the adrenaline, then you come down, you don't sleep when you get back, your sleep patterns off, and you've got to get back to the gym the next week. And you've got to get the jump leads out, so to speak, because you've not, you've kind of not healed psychologically from that defeat properly. You've kind of just put it to the back of your mind, dusted yourself off, and got back in the gym. So a lot of journeymen, I'm not, I can't speak for every journeyman, but I know a lot of journeymen do struggle with it. And uh, this is why they can't be as active as I am myself. I'm blessed with that mental fortitude. Um, I'm fathomable as a fighter. Um, and records are for DJs, mate. I'm here for the invaluable uh, experience. <laughs> the invaluable experience. I you. memories. That's what I'm here for, mate. And I love it. That's quality. I'm definitely going to use that line as the uh, opening line to the feature article. We were discussing that. Off camera, that's absolutely quality. You mentioned there before that about having a good team behind you. I know your trainer is Curtis Gargano, is it? Yeah, have I got that right? Yeah, yeah. Do you and your team, as a journeyman, then focus on the performance rather than the result itself and giving the best account of yourself? And how key is the team behind you, the fighter itself? Very much like football in, and lots of sports, really. The, the team behind the person is actually sometimes more key at certain points. Yeah, well, Curtis is an absolute... He's a, he's a saviour, mate. If it wasn't for Curtis, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Uh, he's paved the way for the journeyman for the next generation. He's given opportunity to lads that might not have got it otherwise, including myself. Curtis gets us quality training, the facilities are up there, top-notch. He gets us quality sparring. I mean, some of the lads I've sparred, mate, are just unbelievable, really talented central area champions, guys that have challenged for English titles, guys that fought on the boxer tournament the other week. I mean, I mean I've been the sparring partners I've been getting, mate, just quality, absolutely quality. And the team is amazing, mate. There's quite a few of us now. There's, I think there's about eight or nine journeymen that are active. Um, so, yeah, but what I'm doing now is I'm going to uh, to Oldham and training two or three times a week still, but I'm also going to be doing one-to-ones with former WBC Silver International Champion, English Champion and British title challenger Shane Singleton. So I'll be oh, doing nice to sharpen up the tools, uh, on the technical work on the technical aspects, because obviously we're that busy over there at the minute and with Curtis having so much going on, 
it's a little bit harder for us to sharpen up the tools. Obviously, as a journeyman, you're fighting every week, so you might be making different weights. So some fight weeks, most fight weeks, become about making weight, strict dieting, crash dieting, and getting the weight off. So sometimes, mate, you have to grind week in, week out. But this is the life I chose. This is the path. This is the lane I'm in, and I love it, mate. But, yeah, as I'm going on, I'm, I'm realising that I'm, I'm gaining invaluable experience because some of the sparring partners that I'm regularly sparring, I'm getting feedback off those fellas and they're saying you're just getting trickier week by week and you're getting better. It's night and day. So I know that how I'm training at the minute, it's definitely working for me, mate. But you can't cheat the evolution of a fighter. You can't fast track. You can't jump it. You're going to have to You're gonna have to go through the levels. And to do that, you have to spar sharper, better, more experienced opposition. You have to apply yourself. You have to train and run when you don't want to train and run. You have to eat stuff you don't want to eat and you just have to come out of your comfort zone. Oh, I'm absolutely just buzzing to listen to you speak with a passion in your voice, Seamus, because it's mental what fighters go through. You basically train for six to 12 months of the year for a 10-second buzz, really, don't you? At the end, you know, lifting your hand. It, it's mental, the psychology that goes uh, behind, behind some of all this, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, mate, I agree with you. But the buzz aspect of it, mate, lasts a lot longer than 10 seconds yeah. because the actual initial 10 seconds, as you say, is the hand being raised or the actual result of the fight itself. But it's afterwards as well. It's the adulation, the respect, the admiration, you know, the whole buzz. I mean, the journeyman life. I mean, some of the best people you will ever meet are in that journeyman changing room. And yeah. I'll tell you something now, it's a lot less serious and tense in the journeyman side, the away side, than it is in the prospect side. I'd say there's a lot more pressure on them to perform. But um, the journeymen, mate, some of the best people you will ever meet and some of the toughest men in the country. Some of the tough. I mean, I've shared a changing room with some of the top, top journeymen, like Dale Arrowsmith, he's fought Bradley Skeet, he's yeah. fought, mate, look at his resume, Jamie Quinn, Devil Child, big shout out to Jamie Quinn. I've had the pleasure of uh, fighting on the same card as him three times. He's an absolute legend. He's about 140 fights deep at the minute. But yeah, so it, it's it, I love the sport, mate. I love the game. As you can say, the passion. That's it's all organic, mate. It's natural. I love this game. The only thing I do struggle with is the food because it's no secret. I do love my uh, my fast foods and my chocolate, mate. But, uh, yeah, yeah. We all love a top taster from Marvin Avenue, don't we? That's what it's all about, lads. You, you mentioned there you sparred with some uh, good quality fighters, Seamus, but a bit off the cuff, have you and Alex, uh, when you are younger, ever done any sparring yourself? And what, what was a particular summer or training session like in your household? We, all you brothers traditionally like families do, you know, uh, knocking lumps out of one another. And did, did that help you both a lot? Firstly, to you, Alex, really. Yeah, well, I'll tell you now, pal. It all stems from back when we were we nippers and we used to have a glove each. And when my mum used to be away, our Johnny, our two Johnnies, Johnny Bull and my brother Johnny, yeah. used to give us a glove each and we used to have a, a drink yeah. of juice in between <laughs> rounds. <laughs> Love it, mate. That's that's quality. Would you say, because Alex is probably significantly bigger than you in terms of height, uh, Seamus, slightly, I would say, uh, did that help you? Spots having those early sort of scraps get the first for a fight, would you say? Yeah, well, I, I had the heads up on Alex in terms of um, boxing. I was always one step ahead because I got into the game before him, obviously. Yeah. And then it was quite a while after until my little brother Patrick, he also know, also followed me into the sport. But what Alex lacked in experience or skill, he made up for in uh, in grit and heart. And I think he was almost in fight of the night every time he fought. Um, and he, and, he, and he did the name proud every single time. That was one thing I can say about our kid. He, all, he always brought the heat and the fire, even when he wasn't mentally 100% ready for the fight. And he, he'll admit that himself. And he still got in and still showed his badge of honour. And he still carried the it's shield. The name, so, it's the name. Yeah, that, that, the name. That we had many, we've had many conversations about it. But... Um, I'm proud of all my brothers, mate, but Patrick and Alex getting into the boxing after me. And they actually won an unlicensed title, uh, which <laughs> we're not about that. We weren't about belts or flash, but for us, it did symbolise something. It was it was special to us because um, we'd all been through some shit together in our adolescence and yeah, um, a lot of uncertainty and uncertain times, mate. And uh, I think they were, they were the most 
secure and certain times we'd had in our yeah. adolescent years and uh, got some priceless memories, mate, looking back. Absolutely we've, priceless. Yeah, we've spoken about you there, Seamus, and you clearly have a lot of, you know, pride and passion in your brother's work. Alex, you've been listening on quite patiently over the past few minutes. Obviously, there, Seamus said you yourself has had an unlicensed boxing crew fights a few times. Can you talk to us a bit about that? Well, I'll be honest, Joe, when Seamus started really going for it and taking it seriously, I could see the, the fire burning in him. And I just wanted to catch a little bit of that smoke, you know what I mean? Just a little bit of that flames, you know, I was unhappy, I was overweight. And I remember finishing work at the Torba at midnight and running up up to Moore at midnight every night with him at the back of me, pushing me. I, and I got I lost. I went from 19 stone, I went down to 14 stone. Oh, man. Just for my first fight, you know, and if I could bottle that enthusiasm that I had then, yeah. oh, I'd be drinking it every night, you know. So I, I, I attribute it to him. You know, a bit of him rubbed off on me that, that time and, and it, you know, it was proper, proper good to just get out there and muck in with my brother. And that's what I thought, if I can add anything to his game by, you know, having those rough rounds, coming at him with a, a, a long reach and a different perspective, maybe, just maybe, I might help him somewhere down the road. So that, for me, that's that's why why I got into it. Nothing but. You clearly helped each other, though, because as Seamus said there, you won an uh, unlicensed title. Can okay, you talk to us a bit about that? And the fact yeah, on so camera where you said you took a fight at a night's notice, yeah. that's quality, so, mate. I was due to fight uh, a lad called Danny Payne, who's a good lad, proper good lad. He's fought a lot of people. And um, for, for some other reason, somebody got injured uh, that was meant to fight for the title. So because I was there and thereabouts in size and frame, they asked me if I'd like it. Well, they asked Seamus. And he said, yeah. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, yeah. And then rung me up and said, you're having a title fight, bro, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's how that ended up. But, yeah, I ended up fighting a lad and uh, it was a really close fight and I, I just nicked it. So that's that's one of my proudest moments. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it's quality yeah. that it just clearly the passion um, infuses within you both. And just to see what boxing does for people is what really inspiring. It, it does it for me as well, as you both know. I, yeah. I, I do a bit of boxing myself and it... It it re really helps. What would you say? Would you say, Seamus, that the government, you know, need to pull more non-contact boxing funding into schools to help kids? Uh, and what's boxing done for your life personally, Seamus? Yeah, mate, hundred percent. I think they should. I mean, back in the day, it was in the um, curriculum, weren't it? I think they used to box back in the 50s and 60s, especially down in London, it was well known, weren't it? They used to box as kids in the school, right from the playground up. And I mean, from personally having my own gym and having the youth of the area of Paddy in my gym and seeing the development in some of their personalities and seeing the way they were and the way they conducted themselves. And it was meant to see, mate. I mean, boxing saves more lives than it ever takes, mate, because it is a dangerous sport. But I do believe that, there needs to be something more for the youth, especially in our town, mate, as you know yourself yeah. from being around here. There's not much for the youth. There's no youth centres. There's no boxing gyms. But um, I plan to change all that, mate, when my career's done and dusted and I've hit 100 fights as a professional because that's one of my ultimate goals, to be a centurion. Um, I'd say I'm the most active journeyman in the UK at the minute, so I'll get there. But, um, yeah, I do believe it. It, it mate, for me, it's worked wonders. For me, it's been my stability. It's been everything. I mean, when I'm unsure, when I'm feeling a little bit down on a low ebb, get myself in the boxing gym and all my problems seem to just be sorted. And there's a clarity to my thinking. It releases endorphins. I'm yeah. happier, more vibrant. Uh, it's, it, it's a lifesaver, mate. It, it, to encapsulate, it, it, it is a lifesaver for myself. And I believe that many other lads in working class environments that don't have an outlet, don't have a voice, feel a little bit weak, inadequate, insecure, whatever. I believe that through boxing, they can find a voice, they can find true strength. And it's a beautiful thing, mate, when someone gets their act together and, and they, they rise out of that despair, mate, because it's a positive thing and it's, it's a knock-on effect, like our kid said there. Seeing me do what I did got him into it. 
and that was a positive knock-on effect yeah. for him and then other people that were close to me. I mean, it's no secret that like, anybody in my circle seems to be doing quite well for themselves, you know, and, and are pretty happy and content. Everyone has the struggles and the worries, but it's, it, it is. It's powerful, mate. It is powerful. It might not be boxing. There's other, there's other things in life. There's other outlets. But for me, boxing w- was the thing. It was my saviour, mate. Same here as well. Like, even as a wheelchair user, I, I might not be able to box, but I've still got a punch bag uh, in my room and I get on that every day. And it just definitely regulates your thoughts. Is that something you would agree with, Alex? And how's boxing impacted your life, even though you're not as active as Seamus at the moment, in it? Well, I was recently saying to Michelle that um, I need to get, even if it's just a punch bag back in the back, you know what I mean? Because you take it for granted until it's gone. And then when it's gone, you, you realise then what it did for you and what extra, you know, it added into your day-to-day. So, I mean, if I was having a bad day, you know, a tough day at work or whatever, those gym sessions that I was inevitably doing to train for an opponent were like my healing. Do you know what I mean? And then I'd come home and I would literally, Michelle would say to me, you're like a new person, but I wouldn't see it. And then I'd have to take a step back and think, do you know what? Yeah. You know, I have got something off my chest today. So for that reason alone, I recommend anybody just to get down the local gym, even if it's half an hour a week, you see the difference of that half an hour of letting everything go does for you. Yeah, definitely. I think the set that there's a saying, isn't there, that self-suffering, not like stupid suffering, but self-suffering through exercise and doing things that you don't actually want to do, but no beneficial for you. It actually brings about happiness, and it's yeah. clearly, clearly the, the thing for you, Seamus. And it, boxing's giving you a path, and long, long may it continue where you get many fighters up and, up and coming in the next few months. Can you talk to us about a, a few of the fights that you've got coming ahead? Because I know Alex told me you were meant to be fighting on the Anthony Yard Lyndon Arthur card, but he said prior to you coming on that unfortunately that opponent pulled out. Yeah, well, it didn't. It didn't pull out. It was. Um, I think there was a bit of a miscommunication on the weight. The weight wasn't right. I couldn't make the weight that they wanted me to make. Um, I think he was about ten stone four. The lightest of a med was ten stone thirteen, and that killed me to make that. So basically, the um, the th- there was a few things that weren't quite right that didn't match up. It fell through. Um, which I was absolutely wounded about, but uh, it is what it is, mate. I was wounded, but you just have to get on with it. It's spilt milk, but I will get an opportunity. Big opportunities will come my way. There's no doubt. I'm only getting better, sharper, and more teak tough and seasoned. So I will make it to that destination. I will make it on the pay-per-view shows. There's no doubt about it. You heard it here first, but um, I've got a fight next Sunday in, um, where is that? Nottinghamshire. Then I have one December 11th in Oldham, I believe, against a gentleman named Thomas Rafferty, little brother of Jack Rafferty, who's actually a rising prospect at the minute, doing really well and fighting for major honours. And then I'm fighting on a Jolly Boys outing, which is an absolutely notorious, well-known show that's held at the same time every year, uh, December 19th. I'll be appearing on that show. And then obviously 2022 is going to be a big year and hopefully I get on some big pay-per-view shows. Um, That's the plan, mate. That's the plan. And how quickly do you want to achieve that W? Is it something that you're being patient about or do you want it soon or... I would love, I would love one. I did say to the missus, um, I said I would get one before Christmas. So I would love, obviously I've got three or four opportunities to do so. Um, the, the problem is it, it, it's hard, mate. You, some weeks become about making weight and not about preparing for the guy that's in front of you. Sometimes you might feel flat. You're fighting every week, so you have to be a bit more cautious than the average fighter. I mean, if you were fighting once every two months, you could throw caution to the wind and put everything into camp and just leave it all in there. But, um, yeah, it's, it, it's quite tough. But I want that W. I do want it, and I will get it. It's inevitable. I will get a win on the road. It, it's going to happen eventually. There's no doubt about it, my man. As I've said before, I've been here before, mate. I've been the um, the little fish in the big ocean. And um, I'll, soon, I'll soon be swimming with the piranhas, mate, and eating with the lions. That's what I I'll can, say. I can tell you, your voice, and I have no doubt that you, you will get a, a win, Seamus, very soon. And 
I'll hopefully hope to be there on one of these local shows around Lancashire soon. Hope to see you get that win. I'll definitely come and support you at one of these events. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both today, boys, and it will be really useful for my feature article. Have you got any parting messages that you'd like to say to anybody? Um, no, I, I want to shout out to my sponsors, actually, and all my team, all the lads at the gym. Curtis Gagano, Stephen Jackson, Scott Williams, James Treyers, Issy Shalemba, all the boys, John Spencer, Brandon Fitton, Stubbs, all you fellas. Uh, massive shout out to my sponsors, Daniel Livesey, Luke Vaughan, Dawn Cryer, David Ridge. Massive shout out to one of my good friends, one of my best friends on this planet, uh, Sean McFarlane. Top man, sports that man today. He's been one consistent throughout my fight career. Um, shout out to all my family and friends because obviously there's that many of them now. I'd, I'll have to, I'll forget somebody. So I'll just shout out to all those people. Massive shout out to my brother for doing this with me today. My brothers, me and my brother are really close. It's no secret. Um, and we're on this journey together, mate. But it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I think you're great at what you do, mate. It's good to sort of talk to a local lad because it was a little less formal and it was very organic and I think you're a top lad and it was an absolute pleasure and I'd do it any other time, my friend. Nice for up the party, and any, any party messages uh, from you, Alex? Uh, not much to say, pal, other than just like what we spoke about earlier with the textbook, take the textbook, fuck it off, and you just yeah, do man. you, pal. Yeah? yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, nice one, boys. I'll stop the recording. No we'll, stay, we'll stay on the Zoom call for a few minutes. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll uh, send you the video soon. Cheers, lads. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thank you, Joe.